Good morning, good afternoon and good evening all. A very warm welcome on behalf of the Sightsavers events team. We are very much looking forward to supporting you during today's webinar, making health inclusive practical lessons from programmes and research. So I'm now delighted to hand over to Jazz to welcome you to the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. I am indeed Jazz Shaban and I am one of three coaches on Bond's Disability and Development Group. I have got shoulder length, brown hair, um, quickly graying, which is a bit worrying. Um, I'm wearing glasses and I have a cream cardigan on. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar jointly hosted by DDG and the FCDO. These joint events scheduled to coincide with the International Day of People with Persons with Disabilities, give or take a day or two, are becoming a bit of a tradition for DDG and the FCDO. DDG has enjoyed a productive relationship with the FCDO and one which we believe is key to ensuring the rights of people with disabilities are upheld in development and humanitarian actions by the UK government and its partners internationally. Today's webinar, Making Health Inclusive, is one such action and involves panelists from across DDG's membership and their SCDO collaborators. So to kick things off, I'm delighted to introduce to you our co-host, Alicia Herbert, who is SCDO's Director for Education, Gender and Equalities. Alicia, over to you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much for that, Jazz. I was slightly delayed because I was just getting my buttons um, sorted out in terms of um, what I uh, what I press. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I am delighted to welcome you to this seminar. Uh, my name is, as Jazz said, my name is Alicia Herbert, and I am the FCDO's uh, Director for Education, Gender and Equality, and also the Gender Envoy. Uh, in terms of what I look like, I'm a black woman, I'm about five foot six, uh, I wear glasses, and this morning I'm wearing a grey jacket with uh, a blue top uh, on the inside. So hopefully that gives you some sense of what I look like. It is... Uh, an absolute pleasure, as I said, to co-host uh, this event with the Bond Disability and Development Group, a group whose members have been an important partner for the FCDO for many, many years and who deliver life-changing support to people with disabilities. And as Jazz said, these events, these annual events, uh, are something that we take great pride in doing with the Bond Disability and Development Group. But before I go on, I would just like to remind us all of some of the staggering figures, which I'm sure that many of you on this call are familiar with. The figures that more than a billion people worldwide have a disability, 240 million of them being children. And evidence indicates that they face barriers wherever they live. Barriers to education, barriers in securing jobs, barriers to accessing medical care. Yet people with disabilities have the same rights to these opportunities and services as everyone else. And we know that we will never achieve the sustainable development goals if we do not include everyone. And so this is core to the leave no one behind agenda. These numbers, these figures, and the window into the lived experience of people with disabilities across the world remind us of the scale of the challenge that still lies ahead but also hopefully motivate us to act. They are the reason why disability inclusion is important to us at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. They are the reason why we invest in a range of programmes. For example, our Disability Inclusive Development Programme, which plays a key role in testing innovative interventions to understand what works in delivering improvements to the lives of people living with disabilities. We will hear two examples today from the DID programs or the disability inclusive programs. And I'm looking forward to hearing about the valuable learning from that great work. But alongside those disability inclusive development programs, uh, we also advocate for mainstreaming disability inclusion in the other interventions, the other investments uh, that we have across the FCGO. In, for example, education programs, 
And so we've got a twin track approach. And indeed, I was quite fortunate um, to be able to see uh, both those approaches, that twin track approach during recent visits to Ghana and Sierra Leone earlier this year. And it is because of these figures, because of those lived experiences of people living with disabilities, in many instances exacerbated by the pandemic, and the changes in our own institutional arrangements here at the FCDO, that we are refreshing our overall strategy and approach. And so we look forward to launching that new strategy at next year's Global Disability Summit, which is being co-hosted by Norway and Ghana. And we are calling with the Norwegians and with the Ghanaians, we're calling on governments, donors and civil society across the world to go even further than the commitments made in, the, in 2018 in London. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Welcome again. And now I would very much like to introduce you to my colleague, Darren Welsh, who is a fellow director here at the FCDO. Thank you. Darren. Good morning. Hey, everybody, just want to check you can hear me. Yes, we can. Fabulous. Great, it's a real pleasure um, to be with you uh, this morning. I'm Darren Welsh, I'm the Director uh, for Global Health at the FCDO, uh, and perhaps just as importantly, I'm also one of our Senior Disability uh, Inclusion Champions, a role I take uh, really seriously. And for anyone who isn't able to see me, I'm a, a white male with fair hair, probably needs a trim at the moment, uh, and I'm wearing a cream-coloured jumper it's a bit chilly here in uh, my converted garage home office. Um, so that's, that's me and where I am. Um, as uh, Alicia has said, people with disabilities uh, often face uh, barriers in many areas of their everyday lives, but health is in some ways even more uh, important and complex than some of those other areas. And it's more critical given that people who live with disabilities require access both to their essential health services, but also often to specialised services which can be related uh, to their impairment or unrelated. And of course, we've been living through some really difficult times which have exacerbated the problems people face. And the pandemic uh, has demonstrated why inclusive health care provision is essential. We've seen services uh, disrupted uh, here in the UK, of course, but also right around the world and we know this is an example of this that 88 percent of people living with disabilities in jordan have been unable to attend hospital for regular uh, checks or for their additional uh, health needs and we know that there are really serious indirect impacts um, from the pandemic as well as the more obvious uh, direct ones and of course even without the pandemic there are many reasons why people with disabilities cannot access medical care. Services aren't always designed with inclusion in mind. There are, of course, cultural factors and barriers in some contexts, and often very practical ones. Sign language interpreters are sometimes banned from medical appointments. Hospitals may not have ramps or lifts, buildings not designed with disability uh, inclusion in mind. So we look forward to hearing a bit later on from Florence uh, and Queen, who will talk about the lived experience uh, of people with disabilities in their home countries. And the barriers they highlight stopping people with disabilities from accessing their rights to the highest available standard of care. And this is something that we in the SCDO really want to help address, building on the leadership that the UK has shown uh, in this field over many years. And we'll hear today about how our uh, FCDO funded A80 2030 programme is seeking to make assistive technology more affordable, bringing our expertise in shaping markets to help achieve that target of reaching 500 million uh, more people with assistive technology. And our PENDA programme is evaluating how effective hygiene measures are at preventing people with disabilities from catching uh, COVID-19. And we've also been raising the importance of mental health and psychosocial disabilities. And we published uh, last year a position paper on how we would take forward uh, this important area of work. So we've been doing quite a lot, but we know that we can do more and we're determined uh, to do more. That's why we're going to have a new inclusive health pillar 
in our refreshed disability inclusion strategy. And that will be a fresh initiative to make health more inclusive and to drive that ambition throughout our work. It will mean stepping up our advocacy in the health sector. It will mean pushing our country partners, our multilateral agencies to do more. It will mean reviewing all our programmes to ensure they are uh, taking account of the needs of people with disabilities. And it will mean working even more closely with our partners uh, in DPOs. Alongside this strategy, we're also going to launch shortly, probably next week, two new approach papers on how we will strengthen health systems globally and how we will work towards the SDG target of ending preventable deaths. And both of those uh, areas of work will advocate for the mainstreaming of disability inclusive health. So we've got a big agenda ahead. We're really committed to making progress. And I, I look forward to working with many of you on this important agenda. Uh, but for now, I'd like to hand you over to the two co-chairs for the event, Alessandra and Katie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Darren. And I hope you can all hear me and see me well. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. I'm Alessandra Rezu, Director of Global Health at Humanity and Inclusion. Um, I'm, uh, uh, I have an oval face, olive skin, brown hair, and I wear glasses. And today I'm wearing a blue dress with a scar colorful scarf around my neck. Um, I, uh, again, for inclusion purposes, uh, invite all the speakers to describe uh, um, yourself in a similar way as we move forward, if you are comfortable with it. I'm honored to co-chair this webinar today uh, together uh, with Katy, and who will introduce herself in a minute. Uh, we will try to build as much as possible on our complementary experience in inclusive health and global health in the mainstream to animate the uh, discussion after the presentations. So uh, we look forward to uh, really hear all the presentations today and to discuss with you. And now I pass the mic to Katie. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here with you all and uh, co-chairing alongside Alessandra. Uh, my name's Katie Husselby. Uh, I'm a white woman. I have long blonde hair and I'm wearing a black uh, flowery pattern top, uh, top this morning. I'm the coordinator for Action for Global Health. Um, we're a UK based network of more than 50 organizations. Uh, working across a range of global health issues. I also sit on the advisory group for the Universal Health Coverage 2030 Civil Society Engagement Mechanism. So particularly looking forward to hearing more today uh, from our speakers, as Alessandra said, about how we can mainstream inclusive health approaches. We've got a packed webinar today full of fantastic uh, speakers. So I'm going to hand straight over to our next speaker, uh, Hannah Cooper, who is the Professor of Epidemiology and the Co-Director of the International Centre for Evidence on Disability at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Hannah is going to give us a presentation on why inclusive health. Hannah, I'd like to invite you to visually describe yourself before you begin your presentation. Over to you. Thank you, Katie. Um, my name is Hannah Cooper. I'm a white woman with mid-length brown hair and I'm wearing a very nice, my very favorite pink necklace. I have been having problems with my internet. So if it fails, please let me know and I'll run to talk from my phone. So as introduced, I'm the co-director of the International Center for Evidence in Disability together with my colleague, Tom Shakespeare, who's presenting later. And we also co-lead the FCDO PENDA project. I'm also one of the founders of the Missing Billion Initiative, which works to promote inclusive health, and I'll draw from this work in my presentation. And today I will be trying to answer the question, why inclusive health, to help set the scene for the following talks. We all know disability is important. Uh, approximately 15% of people in the world have a disability, and people with disabilities are often left behind. And as a consequence, FCDO and other agencies have rightly made disability a priority in their work. This has often focused on inclusive livelihoods or education, but less so on health. And in fact, at the last disability summit, health was not even one of the themes. Global health actors have also often failed to focus on disability. So first, I think it's important to consider why there hasn't been a focus on inclusive health to date. 
And a key reason is a rejection of the mod medical model. And this is a way of thinking about disability, which considers that disability is due to impairments and so should be fixed by the health system. So this medical model doesn't consider the important role of society in the experience of disability and the need to break down societal barriers. Therefore, there's been a shying away from talking about health and the need for health services in relation to disability. But health is important, including for people with disabilities. Indeed, people with disabilities can be described as having a narrower margin of health meaning that they may be more at risk of health conditions as a result of their underlying impairment, as well as structural factors like higher levels, stigma and exclusion. As a consequence, people with disabilities of course can be healthy, but on average have poorer health. This means that people with disabilities can be roughly described as having three types of healthcare need. First, they will need general health services because of their higher risk of poor health. Secondly, they have the same regular healthcare needs as everybody in the population, like for vaccinations or sexual health services. And third, many people with disabilities may benefit from specialist care, like ophthalmology or psychiatry or rehabilitation and assistive devices. The problem is that across all the levels of the health system, there are additional issues facing people with disabilities. This means that health is not inclusive, and these problems are stopping healthcare from being inclusive are often viewed in terms of barriers like negative attitudes, poverty, or inaccessibility. I'm going to propose a new, different way of thinking about barriers or difficulties accessing healthcare, which is a little bit more structured and can help us think about solutions. So another way of viewing these issues is from a health system perspective, to work out why people with disabilities have poorer access to healthcare and how this can be improved. In other words, why healthcare is not inclusive and how it can be made so. On this slide, I show a figure showing the demand side issues facing people with disabilities and the supply side issues which arise from the health system. And I'll describe them in words. So first we can consider issues from the demand side, meaning the person with disabilities. Do they have awareness about their healthcare needs? Do they have the autonomy to make decisions? Can they afford care? We can also consider supply side issues, like where the healthcare professional as others. For people with a range of impairments, is specialist care, rehabilitation, and assistive technology available? If the answer to these questions is no, then it shows which health system failures contribute of people with disabilities. But we also need to dig deeper. Multiple problems in arise from more fundamental gaps with respect to inclusive health. On this slide, I show the systems level failures that make it difficult for people with disabilities to access healthcare so that inclusive health is not achieved. First, there is not always good governance are not always in place or enacted that protect the rights to healthcare of people with disabilities. Often a lack of leadership on inclusive health, health financing. Finally, countries often lack to show what the issues are and how they can be overcome. As a result of lack of inclusive outcomes are often worse for people with disabilities across all areas of SDG3. So people with disabilities are three times, twice as likely to have HIV, twice as likely to be malnourished as a child and 10 times more likely to be the overall mortality rate for people with disability is about four times higher. And the health system is often a reason for the low life expectancy. And finally, the WHO estimates that people with disabilities are 50% more likely expenditure, which can push people further into poverty. We see the same pattern for COVID-19. 
In the UK, people with disabilities make up 16% of the adult population, but 59% of co Inclusive health therefore really matters. It matters to achieve universal health coverage and SDG goals, which won't be achieved if we continue to one billion population. It matters to individual people to maximize their quality of life, as well as their families. And it matters to health to comply with international laws. Moreover, an inclusive health service will not just work better but also for others in the population, like people with temporary impairments, minority language speakers, those with different sexual orientations and other kinds of differences, and so on. What should we do? Well, we need to think about different kinds of entry points into the health system to make it more inclusive. So if we go back to this framework, we can think points. So can we improve policies? Can we put in place leadership on disability in ministries of health? Can we introduce training on disability to medical? Can we link social protection to, and health insurance disability allowances to help overcome affordability issues? Evidence-based so that we are doing the best, um, best things with our limited money to maximize health. And of course, all interventions or changes must be developed by people with disabilities. And if we make these changes, if we improve the health system to be inclusive, then the service coverage will improve, followed by the health outcomes for people with disabilities and others in the population. I will leave it here, and I really look forward to hearing the other other evidence and also inspiration for why and how to make health systems disability inclusive. Thank you very much. Thanks again to uh, Hannah Cooper for uh, her presentation. And now we are moving forward. We are now going to share a discussion between uh, Tom Shakespeare, Professor of Disability Research uh, and the, and the co-director of the International Center for Evidence on Disability at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and uh, um, Florence Najir, um, PhD candidate at the uh, Makerere University in Uganda and Queen Seketi, a University of Zambia um, on the barriers people with disabilities face accessing healthcare. So um, this is uh, a video um, that we are sharing now with you. We hope you can enjoy it. And uh, uh, thank you for starting the video now. So I'm Tom Shakespeare, and I'm really pleased to be with two uh, students who are funded by FCDO, Florence Ndagere and Queen Saketi. And I'm going to be asking them about their experiences of disabled people's access to health. So let me start with Florence. What do you think the main barriers are? Uh, the main barriers uh, uh, with particular regard to access to health are attitudinal, environmental, communication, uh, lack of reasonable accommodation and accessibility. I have interviewed a couple of persons with different categories of disabilities, including the deaf, persons with albinism, persons with uh, physical disabilities, those with psychosocial, the blind, among others. So persons with hearing impairments have told me that when they arrive at the hospital, there are no sign language interpreters and they can't access any health information. So what the doctors do, they just get hold of their hands and take them. Sometimes they prescribe wrong medication because they don't understand what they are telling them. And sometimes if they can't write, then they don't get medication. Um, in terms of attitudes, the girls who go to access reproductive health services, uh, especially those with albinism and those with visual impairments, they are told, hey, even you, uh, who is that man who impregnated you? So such an attitude is really stigmatizing and it's negative. Sometimes they are asked to come into the medical examination room alone. 
and yet they they can't really help themselves because they don't see. So that disorganizes them. Those with psychosocial disabilities have told me that they are tired of consulting medical personnel because when they uh, tell them about their history of psychosocial disability, the doctors make them look stupid. They don't allow them to say anything. They want to make decisions for them. Those with physical disability have told me that the beds are not adjustable, the medical examination beds are not adjustable for them to climb on, and they might instead get another disability if they are not careful. And the hospital facilities uh, do not have ramps, rails, and lifts that can enable them to get through and go out effectively. So those are really barriers, but also other barriers exist in the policy frameworks whereby the reproductive health it's policy talking. is Uganda yeah, okay. well. talking because uh, I want to get Queen in as well. And so, right. Queen, having heard about all these physical barriers and attitudinal barriers and communication barriers, what do you think can be done to overcome those barriers? Okay, um, ac actions can be from both the service side and the, I mean, the, the supply side and the demand side. On the supply side, uh, we could um, encourage ministries of health around the world and other partners to look into disability matters, especially in terms of making sure that health services are accessible. For instance, like Florence has mentioned, all those attitudinal barriers need to be broken. There's need to perhaps um, include in the curriculum for health service providers on how to uh, deal with uh, people with disabilities, not just using the medical lens, but using um, biopsychosocial lens so that all matters are included in, um, in, in their uh, care for people with disabilities. And also in terms of infrastructure, there should be more collaboration between um, ministries that are in charge of um, inspecting buildings to ensure that they conform to the standards uh, such that they are universal design so that everyone can access. Um, then on the demand side, it could be good to also increase awareness because perhaps some of these um, challenges that we have on the demand side are due to inability of people to make certain demands concerning their access right, rights. So if there's awareness creation, that can improve uh, health seeking behavior. And then in terms of uh, acceptability, we also need to, to do something about it so that even the quality of health services is improved, not just for uh, the general public, but to also cater for people with disabilities, wherever they may be. And also issues of affordability in terms of assistive devices. When you look at assistive devices that are um, should be used by people everywhere, people with disabilities around the world. They're quite prohibitive prices. So if there could be something embedded into trade agreements that there should be uh, some um, reduction in prices for assistive devices, it could go a long way in improving lives of people with disabilities wherever they may live on the globe. Thank you very much, Queen. We can try again. <laughs> One more thing. When you face all these barriers, when disabled people face all these barriers, how does it make them feel? How do you think it makes your you and other disabled mm. people in Zambia, Uganda, Kenya, mm. all countries, how do they feel okay. about these barriers? Uh, some of them cry. I've had um, in my previous research on um, determinants of access, uh, determinants of orthopedic service utilization, others shared that they cry. You know, you, you need a new pair of artificial limbs, but then you can't afford. It's way beyond what you can even um, get from your relatives. For instance, you get zero income, you depend on um, family for basics like food and clothing. Then on top of that, here is a device that is costing way above even the head of household's income. 
So some just cry, others forget about it like they don't need them. So there are these other various coping mechanisms so that it, others... They cope without it, in other words, they do with Yes, they do without. It makes them feel sad because um, inability to access that right, I call it a right, access to assistive right. devices is a right for people with disabilities. Once, once that is not achieved, it, it impacts on access to other rights. If they don't have assistive devices, if their children will not be able to walk to school, if they're not able to walk to school, they will not be educated. If they're not educated, they have very, um, few prospects of employment in the formal sector where the pay is good if they are lucky to have i mean blessed in our situation we like to say blessed <laughs> to 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 have people that teach them a skill they can only go as far as just meeting their basic needs but not going beyond that to have the things that they would dream of I remember, Queen, I know you're in Zambia, and I remember talking to a gentleman uh, in, in, in Zambia from uh, 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 Kabalongo, the, uh, the, the area of Lusaka, and mm. I, he said I, he was a person who survived polio, and he had skin, okay. and he, 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 I, he said he was very proud. He had finished, uh, he had finished yes. and I, yes. said, I said, this must have been very difficult for you to get to school. Uh, yes. and, and he said, yeah, it, it took me three hours, three hours in the morning, three hours yeah. in the evening yeah. to walk home from school. I was yes. stunned, absolutely stunned that the yes. other people may walk a kilometer in an hour or whatever, but it took him three hours. What a day yes. yeah, he finished school. So I agree with you. You're obviously completely right. I, I'm mm -hmm. sitting here next to my wheelchair and my wheelchair mm -hmm. is insured for two thousand pounds. And I can't okay. anybody in Uganda or mm -hmm. Zambia mm -hmm. for two thousand pounds. It's like a oh. <laughs> it, it, it for, for a year. So it's luxury. <laughs> I am very lucky to have what I have. Um, exactly. I, I'm sorry we've lost uh, Florence, but I want Florence. to. We might have to record again, but for now, okay. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution, and we'll talk again soon. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. <laughs>
on the DID program in Nepal. Uh, thank you, Shiva. Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us. I'm Shiva Acharya from uh, uh, Humanity Inclusion in Nepal. I'm Disability Inclusion Specialist and also Advisor. Today we'll be discussing about a few barriers to um, access to sexual reproductive health uh, services and also a few actions that are leading towards uh, inclusive society. Uh, first of all, I want to um, draw your attention to facts and figures that have been uh, drawn from the Strengthening Adolescents Sexual and Reproductive Health Rights and Livelihood Program uh, under DID here in Nepal. Um, only two things I want to highlight. I, um, only, you know, when we carried out this study, only 5% of them reported to have attended some kind of educational or informative sessions on sexual and reproductive health rights and services. And less than 10%, only 7% of young persons with disabilities have uh, engaged in some kind of livelihood activities. And even those number, the number of girls have been lower than the number of boys. Secondly, there are you know, barriers um, in system. Uh, um, curriculum in uh, for health workers at any at all levels. For, I, I mean, I mean to say from local to federal level, all health workers, neither in their training materials nor their regular course include you know, something on disability and disability inclusion. Secondly, uh, there are a few materials on sexual reproductive health rights for adolescents from ch for children, but those materials are not adapted to reflect the situation and experience of young persons with disabilities. Similarly, um, you know, the, there's also barrier among uh, uh, another level of uh, access to, uh, like physical access to health system is uh, always the problem. The impact this, you know, SRH, the link between sexual liberal health rights and livelihood is also very stark and we would like to highlight it here. A young persons with uh, disabilities or young couple uh, married you know, uh, from intercaste backgrounds or uh, young person, you know, young couples that they represent different religion than that of their parents are the one who are deprived of sexual reproductive health rights, uh, uh, health services. And this is the group which are also deprived of economic opportunities. So how, what we are doing to support this, um, we, you know, the adaptations on examination systems, certification and curriculum and training are proposed so that uh, TVT, all, all these technical vocational education training program are inclusive for young persons with disabilities. Similarly, we also make linkages to various schemes run by either government or other entities here in Nepal. After this, um, I would like to draw your attention to uh, two different videos that we have here. Um, and one of the video is from OPD representative that he is sharing his observation on access to se sexual reproductive health services to person with disabilities. And the other video uh, is from an accomplished health worker herself, and she is sharing her own stories, her own experiences, uh, what she has to go through 
uh, with regard to sexual reproductive health services. A majority of sexual and reproductive health programs do not consult, consider, or include persons with disabilities. With regard to their sexual and reproductive health, people with visual and physical impairments can easily express their needs, experiences, opinions, and problems. But people with intellectual disabilities and those who are deaf are more likely to experience communication barriers on such issues. As a result of the lack of adequate sign languages and easy to read materials, they have different problems, observations and experiences. Sometimes sexual and reproductive health are cultural taboos and family members often disagree. I am a health worker with a physical disability. During a pregnancy-related checkup, the doctor told me that why did you decide to have a child? Perhaps because of a disability, you should not have a child. For the past 11 years, I have worked in the National Health Service. The Central Health Management Information System still does not include disability information. So despite these barriers, I want to highlight a few things that what works uh, better then. So we learned that if we provide a platform or a place where young persons with and without disability can come together, learn life skills, and also discuss about sexual reproductive health services available to them and about their rights, this would help them immensely in their future and in the long run. Secondly, if there's a support system or support person that can link the family of persons with disabilities to social protection and similar systems that are available at local level and also from the federal government. Thirdly, um, uh, health workers have realized that making assumptions about the problem uh, of patients that are visiting to them or communicating about their problem with the caregiver rather than directly to patients may have adverse effects. Similarly, uh, elected officials have understood and realized that actually accessibility to uh, accessible communication or accessible infrastructures or accessible services are their responsibilities. So for example, uh, having established uh, a, sign language, a pool of sign language interpreters um, uh, so that they can be called upon whenever their, as and when their service is required. And uh, deaf persons visiting hospitals can also have access to health services equally as other without any problem. So I just would like to highlight that attitudinal barriers are really the uh, hardest to crack. But uh, slowly and steadily, we keep pushing and we keep working with organizations of persons with disabilities towards barriers free and accessible society, sustainable society. Thank you. And if there are any observations or questions, I'm happy to take them later. Thank you, Shiva, um, once again for your presentation. And now we pass the uh, mic to um, Landy Aniela for the uh, short presentation on Madagascar for, from the Wish to uh, Action program. Thank you, Landy. Thank you. Um, I'm Landy, and I'm the project manager for Wish to Action at Humanity and Inclusion in Madagascar. I have dark brown hair, long. Um, a tan complexion and I'm wearing a dark red shirt. Um, so I wanna begin uh, by giving a brief overview of the reproductive health context for people with disabilities in Madagascar. Um, and I'll share some key findings on facilitators and barriers for accessing reproductive health services um, that were identified in a barriers analysis study. I won't go into detail about all of them since uh, some have already been mentioned by previous speakers. 
So for uh, facilitators, uh, one that I'd like to highlight is the country commitment for the inclusion of uh, persons with disabilities, um, such as ratifying the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and elaborating a national plan for the inclusion of disabilities. And then for barriers, I specifically wanna highlight um, the last two barriers uh, listed here, since these uh, touch upon the case study example for Madagascar. So uh, the first is the lack of training for medical staff on technical skills for the care of uh, persons with disabilities as it relates to reproductive health. In medical school in Madagascar, there's no specific training on providing services to uh, persons with disabilities. And then secondly, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the country has made commitments uh, for the inclusion of persons with disabilities, but the progress is slow for applying these commitments to the country context. So these um, two barriers um, that I mentioned lead me to the case study example for Madagascar. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so HI Madagascar uh, contributed to an enabling environment for reproductive health um, through the national family planning curriculum. This national family planning curriculum um, is used to train uh, service providers who provide reproductive health services. And this national curriculum is a national document. It's a government document. And it addresses uh, many topics in the curriculum, like the anatomy and physiology of the reproductive system, contraceptive methods, and conducting family planning counseling. But none of these topics include persons with disabilities. So for instance, the section on conducting family planning consultation includes information on family planning for specific groups like adolescents, men, um, or women, women living with HIV AIDS, but it doesn't include uh, persons with disabilities or anything on the rights of persons with disabilities as it relates to reproductive health. So Humanity and Inclusion reviewed all the existing curriculum documents and after reviewing all the documents, it was decided that a new module on disability and inclusion um, would be inserted into the curriculum. And so uh, information was also added to the introduction of the curriculum about the rights of persons with disabilities. So this new module on disability and inclusion was then presented to the National Committee for Family Planning which is composed of uh, various technical and financial partners that intervene in reproductive health in Madagascar, such as international NGOs, local organizations, and it's uh, led by the Reproductive Health Division of the Ministry of Health. The revised curriculum was then validated by the Training and Development Service of the Ministry of Health as they validate all health training materials and training documents. So this process took one year, uh, but now the national curriculum includes a module on disability and inclusion, which is an important step for the sustainability of disability and inclusion in reproductive health for Madagascar. So I'd just like to conclude for HI that we understand that in many contexts, like in Nepal, for instance, persons with disabilities might not have access to comprehensive reproductive education, or like in Madagascar, um, service provider curriculums uh, do not include a disability and inclusive perspective. But we do hope that these examples uh, can inspire you and inspire others. Um, and we're happy to continue sharing our experiences and lessons learned. Thank you. Thanks, Shiva and Landy, for those uh, fantastic presentations and uh, insights into sort of key learnings and, and takeaways from both the DID and WISH programs. I'm now really pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, Andrea Pragel, who is the Global Technical Lead of Inclusive Health at Sightsavers, and is going to be speaking to us about a recipe for disability inclusion in health programs. 
Andrea, I'd like to invite you to visually describe yourself before beginning your presentation. Over to you. Thank you so much, Cathy. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, as Cathy mentioned, my name is Andrea Pregel. I am a global technical lead for inclusive health at Sight Savers. I am a white man with short hair. Um, I'm wearing a purple jumper and a, and a shirt, um, and I use he, him pronouns. Um, today, I will present um, a simple recipe for disability inclusion in health programs. Um, as you have heard from previous speakers, um, there are a lot of barriers at different levels. So there's no single recipe that can um, solve all the issues, but hopefully this will give you some ideas and entry points to particularly mainstream disability inclusion in, in, um, in, in global health um, programs. Um, this specific recipe um, comes from our um, Inclusive Health um, uh, recipe book. Let's see if this might works. Yes, uh, it's from our Science Service Inclusive uh, Health recipe book. In particular, I will be presenting some of the work that we've been doing in Nigeria, in, um, in Kogi State, where we are working with a lot of partners, including the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Women and Affairs and Social um, Development to implement an, an eye care program and we're working to make it more disability inclusive particularly partnering with um, a lot of um, organizations of persons with disabilities opds uh, in particular um, advocacy for women with disabilities initiative the albino foundation Oak foundation and the nigeria association for the blind um, so the first thing you need to consider um, is preparation time. Um, you might need to consider for this recipe between three and six months. Of course, it can vary, but you will need to really allocate some time to make sure the participatory process um, is, is, is there and is planned for. Uh, this recipe will probably take between two and three years to cook, which I appreciate is a bit of a long time. But in, if you want to see some good results, it will take some time. So you will need to be a bit patient. Um, the level of difficulty of um, this recipe, I would say is medium. Um, I'm not gonna lie, it's not, um, uh, if, the, if it's the first time you are mainstreaming disability inclusion into uh, your health programs, then uh, you will need to learn as you go. But um, I'm sure hopefully a lot of these tips will be helpful um, to sort of start mainstreaming disability inclusion into your initiatives. Um, so first of all, you will need to prepare your kitchen surfaces, which means you need to allocate sufficient time and resources to design the project and engage a wide variety of stakeholders. And I'll be talking a bit more about that in a second. Um, you might need to consider in-person or virtual workshops for our project in Kobe State. We did um, uh, hold a, um, a participatory design workshop before the pandemic. Uh, these days, of course, you can use more uh, virtual options. And you really need to think about co-design, which is not about um, asking stakeholders to review whatever you have designed, but it's about co-designing together. And that's really, really important. Um, next, I would very much recommend to, to blend a good amount of meaningful engagement of organizations of persons with disabilities in your program. Uh, so what you need to do is you need to identify relevant OPDs which are working at different level. It could be a national, it could be a state or provincial or district, depending on the nature of your program. Um, but also it's very, very important to ensure diversity of voices. So for example, think about a mix of um, OPDs representing different um, disability constituencies, but also different groups. So for example, consider engaging women-led OPDs. Um, and you need to make sure that OPDs are meaningfully engaged throughout uh, the project cycle. So for example, in our project in Kogi, we have established a steering committee for the project, which is a governance body for our initiative. And it meets on a quarterly basis uh, with engagement of all the stakeholders and um, OPDs are inv involved in, in all the key technical activities as well. And you need to allocate budget um, for reasonable accommodations like sign language interpretation, personal assistance, but also to remunerate OPDs for their engagement um, in key initiatives. Oh, um, Victoria, yeah. Oops. 
Um, we have asked um, uh, one of our partners to share a few tips, uh, particularly for mainstream health organizations who are willing to, um, to mainstream disability inclusion into their program. So um, here we go. Ocheni Victoria EA, the Albino Foundation, Nigeria. Women with disabilities in Nigeria, it's like a double discrimination if you ask me, because in Nigeria or within the black community, let me say, they don't see women to be anything special. And then when you are now disabled, <laughs> they don't even see you to be anything. So within this climate, we, we, we are not appreciated as much as we ought to. What message would you send to other people working in global health? The message I want to send to them is, if you are doing a policy and the person with disability is not there, you have not done anything. They should be included in policy making. They can also work with organizations like Sight Savers who have had experiences working with persons with disability. They can get very good and helpful information from them. End screen. Find out more about including people with disabilities in your programs. www.inclusivefutures.org forward slash b hyphen inclusive forward slash. Inclusive Futures and UK Aid logos at the bottom of the screen. Great. So next, I would um, encourage you to consider sprinkling a bit of accessibility on your health facilities. Um, so we heard that there are a lot of infrastructural barriers within um, healthcare programs. And so one thing you can do is you can consider conducting accessibility audits of the health facilities, engaging with OPDs and, and other health partners. Um, and then you could um, support uh, priority renovations within those facilities to, to identify the key barriers and make the and, and address them to make the facilities more inclusive. Um, in our projects, we are using a toolkit we've developed a few years ago. We always train OPD members and health partners, and then they are the ones going out and conducting these assessments, um, drafting the reports, the action plans, and then and then um, supervising the renovations. Um, the toolkit is a bit is available for free in the sector. Uh, you can download it at uh, sciencesavers.org slash accessibility dash standards. Um, and recently, um, it won an award from the Zero Project as an innovative practice um, in the field of accessibility. So you can get it for free and try it in your programs. Um, next, I would um, recommend, as we heard, uh, there are a lot of attitudinal barriers uh, among health workers as well. So what I would recommend is to gently need um, uh, good knowledge, skills and attitudes working with the health workers and the service providers in your program. So that, for example, can mean conducting a training needs assessment uh, of, of those um, health workers and service providers um, and then developing training resources on disability inclusion and gender equity. Some resources may already be available, like we heard in the case of Madagascar um, or, or other, other countries in, in, um, in context. Uh, but you might want to work with your OPD partners to develop, to develop very specific um, uh, resources which are required for the people you're, being, you're going to be working with in this specific type of intervention. And then a great thing that I think is very important is to train OPD members to be the ones delivering the trainings to the health workers. And that in itself can really have an incredible impact. Um, here's there's a quote from our uh, one of our iHealth program officers. And he said, my top tip would be to avoid stigmatization and discrimination. You can have all the facilities in check, but if your attitude and behavior is not good, uh, people with disabilities will not seek healthcare. So that's uh, how important it is uh, to make sure that you work with um, your health workers and service providers and you uh, support them to come on a journey to really understand more about disability, understand their barriers, and understand the, 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 their concerns and how these uh, issues can be overcome. Uh, next, um, I would recommend uh, wrapping your project in multiple layers um, of inclusive data. Uh, so what you need to do is you really need to collect data, uh, which is maybe disaggregated by age and, and gender, disability. And it's important to use internationally validated tools, such as the Washington Group Questions, 
In this specific project, we use the enhanced tool, which is a bit longer compared to the short version that many of you might be aware of. Um, but then you also need to link your disability data and, and other data with the service provision data. So for example, in this project, uh, we have embedded the disability questions uh, with the patient satisfaction survey to understand how people with disabilities um, uh, sort of felt about the services they received compared to the rest of the patients. Uh, and then, you know, you need to analyze the data and use it to inform your interventions. There's no point in having uh, amazing data sitting on a shelf. Um, next. Um, I think this is the last tip for this recipe. What you need to do is you need to gather your learnings and then you need to serve them work. Uh, so that means gathering your data, your evidence, your learnings, your case studies, the perspective from people engaged in the program. Um, and then you need to disseminate them at different levels as a property. It could be locally, it could be internationally. And the goal is really to influence good practice at different level uh, and influence relevant development stakeholders like maybe government bodies to take action and, and really address some of the key issues you have highlighted through your program. So for example, in Nigeria, because of the work we've done around accessibility um, audits, um, now the National Commission of Persons with Disabilities in Nigeria is now committed and has initiated a process to develop a set of national accessibility standards. So that's uh, that shows that even though you cannot solve everything with a single recipe, sometimes your small recipes can actually influence a, a larger change on, on a bigger scale. Um, so thanks again. I hope you uh, will enjoy this recipe and I look forward to engaging later on in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for that innovative um, presentation. Um, a reminder to please pop your questions into the Q&A box on Zoom. I can see we have a few questions coming in, so please do um, uh, keep adding questions uh, into the box. Finally, before we move into our um, Q&A discussion, we're now going to share a video jointly created by uh, members of the Global Disability Innovation Hub which is a research and practice centre on disability innovation and the Clinton Health Access in Initiative uh, called Assistive Technology, Driving Affordability, Availability and Country Capacity. Hi, my name is Babalo Polose. I did have a TB spine in 2000. That's why I, I have to sit in this uh, wheelchair. and I enjoy every moment of it. So you must always know, you must have a, like a belief on yourself. We have uh, big dreams like everyone else. Over a billion people globally live with disabilities, just like Babalo. Most of us use or know someone that uses assistive technology products. Products like hearing aids, eyeglasses, wheelchairs, or prosthetics. But in low and middle income countries, only one in 10 people have access to the assistive technology products that they need to thrive. As a result, children cannot attend school, adults can't go to work, and many people cannot live independently. The 80-20-30 programme, which is funded by UK Aid, was launched in 2018 at the Global Disability Summit in London. 80-20-30, is a £20 million match funded programme to test what works in getting assistive technology to those that need it. Our goal is ambitious. We plan to reach 9 million people by 2030 and we're going to do this in four ways. One, by improving data and evidence to unlock investments. Two, to support new products and service delivery models through innovation. Three, by laying the foundation for market shaping and systems level change in partner countries. And four, building community solutions to overcome stigma and promote inclusive design. Under the Country Implementation Cluster, we're working with the Clinton Health Access Initiative 
or CHAI in 10 countries to drive affordability, availability and capacity for assistive technology. This is how we seek to transform entire health systems to better include the needs of people with disabilities. Right now, people with disabilities often don't have access to assistive technology because governments don't know how many people need it or even which products are needed. This means manufacturers may not know what kind of products to produce and distributors may not see enough profits to justify delivery to certain countries. Buyers are left with fewer choices and quality products can be expensive. This breakdown is not unique to assistive technology. A core piece of Chai's work is shaping markets to lower costs and increase availability of essential drugs, diagnostics and devices across many health areas. We help governments maximize the impact of limited funding by negotiating agreements with companies to make products more affordable. We also support countries to determine which products are needed, how best to distribute them, and ensure demand is sustainable. Under 802030, we are showing how market shaping can drive better access to assistive technology. We started by assessing the existing capacity of our partner governments to provide assistive products and services to their populations. Then we got buy-in, bringing together usually fragmented ministries and other stakeholders, such as civil society, to make limited funds go further. We also realized better tools were needed to collect and share data to help policymakers understand where they should invest. And finally, we worked to integrate assistive technology into government procurement and supply chains. This approach is working. In Malawi, for example, our work led to the first ever national policy for medical rehabilitation, which was developed in record time. In Malawi, the assistive technology country capacity assessment showed that person who needs assistive product like wheelchair could not get it from public health facilities. This is due to one, financing, second, procurement mechanism, third, standard. As a result, they would typically receive donated wheelchair. These wheelchairs might not be adapted to their needs. If it breaks, might not be repaired easily because parts are not available locally. And this might leave the person with no means of mobility. The newly developed National Medical Rehabilitation Policy helps to advocate and ensure anyone who needs quality rehabilitation service, assistive product, and follow-up support could receive them from public health facilities. The policy does this by helping government set quality standards and prioritize budget for assistive product, repair, and training. As Miret have shared, supply chains for assistive technology in low and middle income countries are often not effective. Charities directly donate products in many of these countries meaning the government can't always track the real needs of its people and the people with disabilities may rely on unsustainable donor funding to receive the products they need. New types of partnership with global and local suppliers are required, ones that do not rely on donations. Uh, instead, we need to work with suppliers to lower costs across the entire supply chain to make services and products faster and cheaper for the end user. In South Africa, for example, our work has significantly reduced the cost of spectacles, and I will let our colleague Chakra explain. In South Africa, the majority of people are uninsured and rely on the public sector to access spectacles. However, while most of the provinces provide IK services, they do not provide spectacles due to budgetary constraints and poor supply chains. 
we worked with one province, KwaZulu-Natal, to set up a hub spoke delivery model that reduced the cost of spectacles by 50%. First, we established an optical lab at the provincial eye care hospital. Spectacles are produced at the central hub, while eye, eye exams and prescriptions are provided by surrounding districts. We helped the province pool demand via a national tender that negotiate better prices for lenses and frames. At the same time, we worked with the government to establish dedicated funding to ensure the hub and spoke model was sustainable. Each of these steps reduced the cost along the entire supply chain. As a result, a pair of spectacles cost 150 rands or less than 10 pounds. The stories from Malawi and South Africa are early examples of how successful our approach can be. Now is a critical moment. Governments are launching ambitious plans to provide assistive technology to people living with vision, hearing and mobility impairments. We have an opportunity to match their excitement by supporting the implementation of these plans. Going forward, CHAI, through our work with AT2030, is ready to meet this momentum. We are so grateful for the work of the FCDO and other dedicated advocates and supporters of increasing equitable access to assistive technology globally. Thank you very much. Thank you once again for uh, this uh, final contribution. And uh, with uh, this video, we have concluded uh, the presentations for today. And I now um, invite uh, uh, our panelists, uh, um, Tom, Landy, uh, Shiva, Andrea, Naomi, and uh, uh, Frederick uh, to join us uh, um, in the panel. Please uh, um, bring, uh, turn on your videos. Uh, so that we can prepare for the discussion and uh, uh, thank you for being once again once again for being with us today thanks alessandra um, i'll kick off with the first uh, question we have a question from uh, melissa cockroft from ippf um, for uh, landy um, melissa asks how difficult was it to convince the madagascar government of the importance of including the module on disability into the national family planning curriculum. What were some of the challenges and what strategies did you use? Andy, over to you first. Great, thank you. Um, it was actually not very difficult to convince the government um, about including a module on disability and inclusion. Uh, it was actually at the time the director of the Division of Reproductive Health at the Ministry of Health who solicited HI for support on uh, including disability into the national curriculum. I think probably the biggest challenge is, is the time frame of how long it took. Uh, the curriculum is composed of three documents. So there's um, a reference manual, a trainer manual, and a participant book. And so all three of these documents had uh, to be revised at the same time to include this new module. And then, um, as I mentioned, it had to be presented to the uh, committee, the National Committee for Family Planning. And then it was the Division of uh, Reproductive Health at the Ministry of Health, uh, who then had to send it over to the Department for uh, training at the Ministry of Health for validation. And it was the validation process that took the longest. Thank you, Landy, for your answer. And uh, we would like now to move to the next question that uh, uh, was asked by Emma Zaya. Uh, the question is for you, Andrea. Um, what would you say to someone who, um, who says that reaching people with disabilities in health programs is too difficult and expensive? What would be your answer? Thank you, Andrea, for your answer. Um, thanks for that question. I mean, I, I would say it doesn't have to be. Um, very often disability interventions end up very, being very expensive because they're not factored in at the very design stage and retrofitting is always going to be more expensive. Um, so embedding disability inclusion and accessibility 
within whatever you're doing within all your interventions from the very initial design stage is going to be a critical factor to keep um, costs at a lower level. That being said, it is crucial to make effective investments and to make sure you have budget lines for inclusion and disability in, in your projects. Um, but also in terms of reaching people. So again, it doesn't have to be. So for example, uh, many health programs already have um, um, outreach interventions, for example. Um, and at Science Service, we have worked um, we, we kind of had to tweak this model to, to, to make it more disability inclusive and to be more effective, particularly in rural areas. And so we have kind of uh, embedded a, a twin track approach into it. On the one hand, this is about uh, making general outreach activities more um, inclusive and accessible. And on the other hand, it's about um, sort of uh, developing targeted interventions aimed at reaching the uh, sort of more, more marginalized populations and working in collaboration with local stakeholders like OPDs, but also other organizations uh, which represent more marginalized groups. And, and very often these organizations have the contacts, but most importantly, they have the trust of the people they sort of work with and represent. And so working together and working in partnerships is going to be, again, a critical factor to, 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 reach, to reach people. Thanks, Andrea, for that response. Uh, Tom, I was wondering if I could turn to you next um, for a question from uh, Harriet Knowles. What do you think are the key messages we should be giving to governments to ensure continuity in health services during the pandemic or crisis for people with disabilities? Um, can I first answer the first question? The reason that we should include disabled people is because we make up 15% of the population. So any health system, any health offer, which doesn't include 15% of the population is against human rights, but it's also undemocratic and, and un unhelpful. It doesn't reach people. I think that the messages that we need to give are that disability inclusion doesn't need to cost much. Um, the, 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 the women I talk to, they have the same uterus, the same womb as every other woman. Just because they're disabled makes no difference. What makes a difference is the attitude of the healthcare provider who believes that pregnant, uh, that, that women with disabilities cannot get pregnant. So I believe that we need to shift attitudes. We need to teach healthcare workers basic disability etiquette, i.e. ask, want, uh, need to know, not want to know questions. Talk to the disabled person, not to the interpreter or the parent or the relative. Listen to them. Um, avoid diagnostic overshadowing. So all of these issues are, should be throughout healthcare, should ensure continuity, and it's basic healthcare providers that need to know them. And so I would hope that whether it's doctors or nurses or paramedics or uh, uh, allied health professionals, within their training, they will understand that disabled people are people first, people like everybody else, and that they have health needs, maybe particular ones, but they have general health needs. And I think that should ensure continuity so that when you see a patient, when you see a person, you see that person. You don't think, oh, they can't be pregnant or, oh, they don't need the service. Of course they do, they're human beings. Thank you, thank you, Tom, for uh, your answers. And uh, we are uh, now uh, moving forward uh, um, with the, uh, the next question uh, that was uh, um, asked by uh, Suzanne Rogers uh, and uh, uh, is a general question for um, uh, all the panelists, but uh, uh, maybe we can direct it to um, uh, those of you who had not yet uh, uh, had the opportunity to uh, to speak, and the question is, uh, um, um, as Susan is asking, uh, um, how uh, you would uh, influence health information systems to ensure data is collected and disaggregated by disability, what works and what doesn't work, and uh, I would like to know if, uh, for example, uh, Frederick uh, feels uh, uh, in a position to um, to answer to this question. Can I um, come in here with my observation? Please do, please go first. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, no, in, in Nepal also we try to, because um, our central health management information system have kind of subsystem where uh, they can input disability. However, that is not um, translated 
at local level. Health facilities, the register which they use, uh, they don't have any box or anything to, to mention on disabilities of uh, persons that visiting their facilities. And generally, when we spoke to health workers, they are willing, they are happy to contribute and they think it's important. But I think it's it's not rolling out there. It's not, it's not been rolled out. So um, recently, we have um, with with cooperation from uh, local health authorities, we are trying to uh, embed Washington Group of short set of questionnaire in a OPD's register, so that each of uh, a, in a, everyone visiting that facility would be asked those um, six questions. I mean, the short set questions, and if they report difficulties in at least in one domain, then they would be referred to uh, disability uh, register and for further um, you know, investigations and other uh, data. So we are yet to see the result, but um, we are hopeful that this would um, somehow would encourage and, and uh, convince our government to, to take up uh, and, and improve health management information system. Thank you. Thanks, Shiva. Maybe if I can turn to you, um, Frederick and Naomi, we've had a question around assistive technology. Um, from Elena Schmidt asks, uh, international development programs have been distributing vaccines, antiretroviral drugs, mosquito nets, and most recently NTD drugs for many years. The supply chains are well established and in most countries are well integrated within the government owned systems. How much do we consider opportunities created by these programs and use these channels for distribution of assist assistive technology at scale? Uh, maybe Frederick, I can turn to you first and then, and then to you, Naomi. Very happy to. And the answer is absolutely. Um, that's what we're considering. But I think the starting point is knowing what will be included, uh, which is exactly why we need assistive technology is so broad it, it it covers so many different products there is a model list by the who but those need to be contextualized so that is a starting point to understand what uh, what products need to be included into those supply chains then uh, the the quality standards should be established uh, the specifications um what, what do we consider appropriate products to procure and then the mechanisms need to be put in place to understand how many products need to be procured regularly and then where they need to be distributed. And then obviously there's a component of building the capacity within those existing um, mechanisms that have been established for, in many, uh, for supporting the procurement of, of commodities for many other health areas, building the capacity for procurement, for inventory management, um, for uh, the in-country supply. So absolutely embedding uh, assistive products into the existing supply chains is key, but there is there is definitely a a process to get there, which we're now making progress on in a number of of countries, and hopefully we'll have more uh, best practices to share in the near futures uh, for other countries to follow. Naomi, I don't know if uh, you want to comment on that. Yeah, I think just to say that it's it's really key to. First, I think have a picture of, of, of assistive technology within each country. And I think that's that's what the importance of the country capacity assessments have done, have kind of evaluated a country's capacity to deliver appropriate AT and what the need is. And, and once we understand that, we can look at the best way to provide it. Yeah. Thank you uh, for your answers. And uh, our uh, next question that came from uh, Sean Martinez. Um, uh, is uh, exploring a little bit more the efforts and asking about the efforts that has been made uh, to include uh, persons with disabilities in sexual and reproductive health services, particularly at the intersection of LGBTQI+, uh, uh, race, uh, ethnicity, and poverty. And Lendi, um, uh, maybe you can take uh, this question. Okay. Um, so uh, I... In the Wish to Action project, our um, main target populations are uh, people low income, uh, poverty, um, and uh, vulnerable populations, so people with disabilities. So uh, 
in in the wish project we work to address all of those uh target populations and in, in aspects i mean so like i mentioned in the presentation uh you know we tried um at several levels to um include uh, people with disabilities into sexual and reproductive health services. So, uh, for instance, you know, having uh, included a curriculum on disability and inclusion into the national curriculum for service providers who provide reproductive health services. I didn't mention in the presentation, but we also work with organizations for persons with disabilities that we partner with, um, who we uh, gave capacity building on reproductive health so that they can also go into the community and to other organizations for persons with disabilities uh, to provide awareness raising about the existence of reproductive health services and also the rights of uh, people with disabilities. Thank you, Landy. And uh, maybe to uh, go one step forward in uh, uh, answering to Sean, we can also say that very often uh, the uh, working and at the intersection uh, of uh, uh, different factors uh, uh, and identities, including the LGBTQI plus um, identities is essential, but uh, we see that is still uh, um, many of the project, projects uh, that um, are implemented on disability inclusion um, need to strengthen the uh, perspective, the intersectionality perspective that brings together all the different factors that you have listed, uh, shown in your in your question. And uh, uh, therefore, the real call is for everybody who is engaging um, in this project to keep uh, really the international pers intersectional perspective um, in mind, uh, because uh, uh, often, for example, when we work on family planning, uh, there is this uh, a bit traditional uh, um, idea that family planning is also for heterosexual couples. And of course, this, uh, this is a long conversation that we cannot have here, but we need to go to move forward and make sure that everybody is included in the work that we do on sexual reproductive health, um, keeping this intersectional perspective. And uh, um, Katie, back to you for the next question. Thanks, Alessandra. I think sadly we've now run out of time. So just a huge thanks to everyone, um, uh, for all, to all of our speakers, all of our panelists um, for this Q&A discussion and for all of your insightful responses and comments. Uh, for our final item of the webinar, I'm going to hand back over to Alicia, who's going to provide us with some closing remarks. So Alicia, over to you. Great, thank you very much um, for that, Katie. And I hope that um, those of you on the call um, can, can hear me. It's quite remarkable. I keep looking at the numbers at the bottom of the screen and it's quite remarkable that we still have quite a large number of people um, on the call, which is a testimony to the richness of, um, of the conversation over the course of the last hour and a half or so. Um, you know, we've heard a number of informative and valuable uh, examples today, you know, about how uh, significant the consequences are for people with disabilities if we do not address their needs in design and implementation and a whole range of needs and a whole range of people living with disabilities as well. Um, but above all, you know, Queen and, and Florence's research demonstrates why it is so important to remain true to nothing about us without us. And people with disabilities are the people who are best placed to tell us what the barriers are. It is then our responsibility as a society to remove those barriers and to support efforts to do so. Uh, it isn't always easy uh, to know how to remove the barriers or what can be done better. But hopefully some of the messages that we have heard today will help direct policies and interventions towards the most effective solutions. And indeed, we'll continue to build that evidence. I would like to thank everyone who has spoken today, uh, as well as everyone who has contributed to the work uh, presented. Thank you very much to the Bond Group for co-sponsoring the session and to Debbie and MYT uh, team for hosting it. Uh, thank you to everyone who has attended and asked questions. And I hope you all took something away uh, from it today. And finally, thank you to both Alexandra and to Katie for chairing the event and for guiding this discussion. Uh, thank you very much and do enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.